great endurance, as we talked about last time, it's what commends us uh, to the world. When they watch Christians go through difficulties, go through highs and lows, and, and maintain our faith in the Lord and continue to grow, it, it kind of marks us, establishes us, stamps us as, wow, what they're saying is significant. What they're saying corresponds to reality. It makes us a better witness. I hope uh, last week this passage in 2 Corinthians 6 kind of caused us to examine how it is that we're enduring in the difficulty of COVID, of all kinds of things, of the weather lately, uh, how we endure it. Are we are we doing that as followers of Jesus and doing it well? I hope you noticed in that, by the way, that making the gospel as relevant as it can be, as powerful as it can be to our culture, never in the mind of Paul or in the mind of God ever has anything to do with making it entertaining or um, making it more, uh, dumbing it down, uh, more approachable or becoming as worldly as possible. No, being the best witnesses we can be means following Jesus the best we can be. And today we come to a hinge in this letter, uh, chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 and 13, kind of this hinge. He's been talking to them about how he, how he loves this ministry, the gospel ministry. And he changes gears here and begins to remind the Corinthians of how much he loves them. And we read it in verse 11, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak to you as children. You also be open. The, the meaning there is a little bit um, shaded by the use of that word restriction. When I hear restriction, I think of a rule or a, a moral law. But he's talking about restriction in their affection. And I think in this case, the NLT does a great job of capturing what he's saying. Listen to it from that translation. Oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part. There's that thought of restriction. There's no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. And I'm asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. So Paul says, something's hindering your love for us and, and ultimately for Christ. What is it that's doing that? Well, we read on in verse 14 and we find out that there is a mistress in this relationship, another that they are loving that's keeping them from true love toward Paul and toward the Lord. Listen to verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Another word for the devil. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people Come out from, and therefore come out from them, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, and this bridges over to the beginning of chapter seven, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul says, I love you, desperately love you, dearly love you, but your love for me and for Christ is shaded because of your love for the world and the people in it, unbelievers. Um, let's pray and we'll think about that. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that you teach us. Uh, Lord, we need to grow. We want to grow. We want to be more like Christ. So will you please help us to look to him and to look to your word today in Jesus name. Amen. Paul reminds us of this need for separation and really shares uh, three things with us about it. We'll unpack that in just a minute, but I want to give us a sense of just the consistency of this command to be separate from the world, because sometimes maybe we miss that notion. James 4, uh, verse 4 says, chapter 4, verse 4, you adulteresses, 
talking to Christians. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In other words, deep connection, deep companionship with worldly people wounds our relationship with God. Revelation 18.4, we're studying that this Sunday night in our church. And here we're here in the end times, he says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. And this her is the world system. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her punishment or her plagues. And 1 John 2.15, another passage that is familiar to some, uh, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. Listen to that uh, twofold description there. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What's the distinction between the world and the stuff in the world? If you took all the stuff, um, non-living stuff out of the world, all the Porsches and all the Lamborghinis and all the diamonds, and if you took that out, what would be left? It would just be people. So he's talking here, not just about, I think we hear we need to be separate from the ways of the world. I think we hear that well. But here he's saying there needs to be a separation from the people of the world. So I want us to think through that a little bit. We'll talk maybe more today than usual about application because surely God intends his people to have a balance here. We need to engage with people. We need to talk with them. But yet, the thing we first need to grab is this truth that there has to, in some sense, be a separation. Paul goes on here and gives three reasons why there must be a great separation between his people and the world. And the first reason he gives is the believer's nature, that we are totally different from the world. Paul uses a picture in the Old Testament in verse 14, when he says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We don't normally think about uh, being yoked with people. He's using this biblical uh, picture of tying two animals together with a wooden yoke on both of their necks. And he kind of pulls this from Deuteronomy 22. And this is verse 10. You shall not plow or yoke with an ox and a donkey together. That's one of the many rules in the, in the Old Testament. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. And he goes on right after that to say, and you shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. And we read that and we go, that's, that's kind of crazy. God, are you being a little, little over the top here, a little too rule uh, oriented here when you tell us how to, which animals to hitch together and which fabrics to, to knit together in our, our clothing seem to be harmless thoughts, but they do have practical intent. So if I wear a shirt that, let's say the top half of it is wool and the bottom half of it is cotton, um, that may be a good look, but when I clean it, wash it, dry it, those fabrics are going to respond very differently to that because they're such different fabrics. And what's going to happen to that shirt? Well, the shirt's going to tear. The shirt's going to, those two parts are going to uh, fade differently. They're going to shrink differently. It's, it's, not, it's going to be a mess of a garment. What about this notion of yoking an ox and a donkey? Well, well if you got an ox and a donkey and they get along, why don't you yoke them? Well, because they're totally different animals. Uh, their leg length is different one to another. One is up and one is down. What happens if you try to walk with one long leg and one short leg? Well, you're going to end up walking in a circle or you're going to end up plowing um, a, a, a rut that is going off center. Now, God's not up in arms here about how long our clothing lasts or how straight our furrows are. What he's doing here is giving an object lesson about deep relationships. God's not concerned with what we plow with or what we wear in the sense of fabric. He's concerned to teach us an object lesson about relationships, a mixed yoke of unwholesome partnership. An attempt to find common ground where none exists is going to lead us in a wrong direction. Think about an ox and a donkey again. Not only are they different heights, but they're very different in nature from each other. 
And Paul refers back to this picture in explaining the nature of the difference between unbelievers and believers. How different are they? I'm just going to share a couple of writers that I've read on this week. One of them says this, believers and unbelievers inhabit two opposing worlds. It's like they're from different planets. Christians are in Christ's kingdom, which is characterized by righteousness, light, and eternal life. Unbelievers are still in Satan's kingdom, characterized by lawlessness, darkness, and spiritual death. The saved and the unsaved have different affections, different beliefs, different principles, different motives, goals, attitudes, and hopes. We are so very different from each other. Kent Hughes, another writer, put it this way. The unbeliever's life is centered on self. The believer's life is centered on Christ. The treasure of the one is here on the earth. The other is in heaven. The values of the one are the values of this world. The values of the other are the values of the world that is to come. The believer seeks the glory of God. The unbeliever seeks the glory of men. And the point is the same. To bind those two together in a deep connection is to invite trouble. So he says, for that reason, because of our nature, he says, oh, we should have a separation. The second thing he talks about here is because of Scripture's commands, we should have a separation. And this is verse 16 and 17. Um, neither one of these quotes, the one in verse 16 or the one in verse 17 through 18, neither one of those are single verses out of Scripture. They're what we call a catena, or a ch that's a Latin word for a chain. And Paul particularly uses catena, or chains of verses, when he's trying to show that this simple truth is everywhere in the Old Testament. So this truth of verse 16 is found in Leviticus 26, and in Exodus 6, and in Exodus 25, and in Exodus 29. It's the clear teaching that there is a covenant intimacy between Israel and God. He is theirs, they are his, and this is, again, marriage language. He says, I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God, they will be my people. Over and over in Scripture, he says this command, you are, you are to be with me and I am to be with you. And that marriage language, again, goes back to that, and I won't share with you, I won't share you with anybody else. Verse 17, and the truth that's found there, we find this one in Isaiah 52 and in Ezekiel 20 and in Numbers 33. Multiple times through Scripture, God issues a command for the separation of his covenant people. In the book of Numbers, he talks to them as they're entering the promised land. You remember they're leaving Egypt, entering into the promised land. He says, come out from among them. Be separate from them. You can't carry their ways with you into the promised land because you are so different. That's my command to you. And later on, he, he commands them when they get in the land, he says, hey, you can't absorb the ways of the people around you. You can't become united with them because you will follow after their ways. Come out from among them. Don't be like them. But later in Isaiah, as they're leaving Babylon after captivity, they have been, this is a beautiful biblical picture, they have been vomited out of the promised land because of their idolatry. They go to Babylon in captivity. And when they come out in Isaiah, he says this same thing again. You must come out from among them, not just out of that location, but separating yourself from these people and separating yourself to God. Paul's just saying with this, these chains of verses here, it's always been that God's people are to separate from the ungodly or the people of the world. And listen, this is a hard statement, but we can't let relevance or even the Great Commission change that command that we are to be a separate people. Now, I'm begging you, don't turn this video off because we need to talk about that notion of the Great Commission. But whatever we're commanded about the Great Commission does not nullify the fact that we are still to be separate from the people of the world. The third reason for a separation is just God's promises. Verse Chapter 7, verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh. Since we have these promises, what promises is he, or is he talking about? Well, he's talking about verses 16 through 18, this promise of God's intimacy with us. 
And here's a general truth in all of Scripture. Grab this and hold on to it. The grace and the mercy of God precedes his commands. And, and that grace is a motivator for greater faithfulness to God. And I'm going to share that again. The grace and the mercy of God precedes the commands of God and is the motivator of greater faithfulness to God. In other words, it doesn't start in verse 16 with this thought. If you morons will do better, I will, I will love you and I will be your God and you'll be my people. No, he doesn't say that. He just says, I will be your God and you will be my people. That is grace. He says, in other words, I don't love you because of what you do. I love you and I'm with you. And with that in mind, I'm telling you to do these certain things. There's this heightening, if you notice it, between verse 16 and the verse in 17 and 18. In verse 16, he says, I will be their God. They will be my people. Then he says, uh, come out from among them and now listen to the heightening of that God-people uh, relationship. He says, and I will be to you a father and you will be sons. Do you see that, that deepening relationship? I will be your God. You will be my people. And then come out from among the world and I will be your father and you will be my sons and my daughter. That is a heightening. Grace, I love you, leads to faithfulness. Come out from among them. And that leads to a deeper fellowship. And by the way, let me just grab this notion while we're talking about it. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, please hear this. God does not look at you in Scripture and say, now if you'll straighten your butt out, I, I will love you and I will save you. That has never been the gospel message and we need to make sure we know that. God says, John three sixteen, the most well-known verse, maybe, in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever trusts in him, believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. He doesn't say, straighten your rear end up and then I'll send my Son for you if you'll do right. No, he said, well, elsewhere in Scripture it says this, this is the love of God. This is how the love of God was shown to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What comes first there? The grace of God comes first there. And then the command of God, come to me, uh, repent and trust in Jesus. And then there comes this greater faithfulness. Please don't fall for this line of thinking that says, if you'll get good enough, God will love you. God says today, I love you. I love you. I have sent my son to die for you while you were yet a sinful person, sinning with abandon. And now he just says, come to me. Come to me. Uh, don't fall for works-based salvation. He doesn't say clean up and then I'll, I'll accept you. Um, so we've got this command of God and we've got this uh, faithfulness, this grace of God that calls us to greater faithfulness. All of that just says this one thing. There needs to be a separation between God's people and the people of the world. And now I want us to think about application um, in all of this. We are different creatures. We are made new and we are no longer like the world. And we're called to not be unequally yoked together with him as if we're still the same. What does that look like? Does it look like monasticism? Monasticism, big word, lots of syllables. Does it look like us separating ourselves physically from the world? In other words, we would build a big wall around us. We would put our little houses inside the wall to keep us nice and insulated from the world and we just would not interact with the world at all. No, that is not, not at all what this uh, obedience to this command looks like because we do still have the Great Commission. We are still expected to live in the world and to live among people in the world and to share the light of the gospel with them. Paul's been clear, by the way, that that's not the case. So let's make sure we see this in the bigger picture. First Corinthians chapter five, Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle, my letter, not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean not to keep company with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters in the world, since then you would need to go out of the world. 
Paul, Paul says, I'm not, what he warns them about in 1 Corinthians 5 is don't, don't deeply fellowship with a believer who claims to be a believer and yet he lives like hell. Don't do that. But he said, don't misunderstand me. You need to go interact with the immoral of the world. So he knows we need to interact. Again, 1 Corinthians 10 says, if any of those uh, who do not believe, unbelievers, if they invite you to dinner and you desire to go, he says, go to unbelievers and eat. Eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. So listen, all of this means that there must be some middle road, some middle way in between complete withdrawal and yoking together with unbelievers. Jesus knew what that middle way was. And this is where we need to find ourselves. Matthew records this about Jesus, that he knew how to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, he didn't have deep yoking relationships with them, but he certainly didn't avoid them because he wanted to go spend time with them to share, to present himself to them, to present the gospel to them. And at the same time, so he, he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, it also says he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. The middle way is right there. How do we find that? Um, it involves wisdom. Uh, church, you've been given the mind of Christ. Did you know that? You have the wisdom to navigate this. It involves wisdom. It involves honesty. Be careful because you, you may lie to yourself about what's appropriate for you and what's not. It requires wisdom and honesty and discernment. And I think the principle is this, and I'm stealing this from a man named Sam Storm who wrote on this. He says this, he, he thinks the crux of this command is this, enter into no relationship or bond or partnership or endeavor that will compromise your Christian integrity or weaken your will for holiness or cast a harsh shadow on your reputation as a believer. Let me read that again. Enter into no relationship, bond, partnership, or endeavor that will compromise your Christian integrity or weaken your will for holiness or cast a harsh shadow on your reputation as a believer. And so to that end, here's some questions that I think would be helpful for me to ask and for you to ask when it comes to relationships with unbelievers. Number one, when I am with these non-believers, do I find myself in situations in which I'm dangerously exposed to temptation that may get the better of me? In other words, is my relationship with these people such that it would put me in a situation where I might be apt to fall to sin? And that requires honesty, right? Uh, of course, there's something in us that says, oh, I'll never do that. Be careful. Um, pride comes before destruction, right? A haughty spirit before a fall. Be careful. Be honest with yourself. Second question, when I am with the non-Christians in question, do I find it easier than at other times to compromise on ethical matters? Do I find myself judging as gray or questionable what I would easily call sin if I were with other believers? And if you do, then the wise response would be separate. Come out from that situation. Come out from the depth of that relationship. Number three, does my association with non-Christians tend to make me less vocal about my faith, less visible in my stand for Christ? If it does, then it ought to be the little alarm bell going off to say this relationship is pulling me away, not pulling them toward Christ. Number four, when I am with non-Christians, does conversation focus primarily on things of the world or is there also opportunity that I take for discussing spiritual matters? Again, it's just some telltale signs that it's pulling you away instead of pulling them to Christ. Another question, a final one, does my association with non-Christians serve as an offense to other, and this is an important word, to other mature believers or is my association a cause of reproach to the gospel? 
And I'm careful about how I say that because Jesus associated, Jesus, um, his relationship, his connection with tax collectors and other sinners was offensive to some people who claim to know God, but they weren't mature people. So yeah, I could offend people by saying, well, I spent a lot of time with people in jail. Um, but I promise you, I'm not, I'm not offending God by spending time with him. But if it is an offense to other mature believers, then that ought to be something that makes you back up and go, wait, I need to reevaluate this. Or if it causes a reproach to the gospel. Those questions are helpful to me. And I think the very easy lines that we can draw based on this passage and some of those questions is certainly marriage. I would never, ever, and this is a direct command of God. And the Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, any marriage after your conversion must be only in the Lord, meaning only with somebody else who's in the Lord, who's a believer. Uh, we should never yoke ourselves. There's no deeper yoking together than a covenant marriage. And we should never, Christian, uh, yoke ourselves to an unbeliever in that sense. Another easy line is kind of hinted in the questions, relationships that put you in moral temptation or moral danger. That's an easy one. I don't need to be there. I had a brother this week in the Lord tell me, I can't go there because I can't handle the temptation that I face there. And listen, that's not an admission of weakness or, or some something I would look down on him. I, to me, my view of him increases. What a wise brother to say, I can't go there because I would be tempted in a way that I couldn't probably honor the Lord with. Another easy one um, is non-Christian practices or spiritual practices. I'll put my little rabbit ears up. Spiritual practices with non-Christians. And it sounds like this. Listen, I can't do transcendental meditation with you. Sorry, I can't do it. I can't do astrology together with you. I can't do occultic practices together with you. They may seem harmless to you. It may fit into your universal picture of all, all gods and all religions lead to the same place, but it doesn't fit into mine and I can't go there with you. I can love you. I can share with you. I can do other things with you that maybe I could use as a means of reaching you, but I can't do those practices with you and call that ministry. Um, less clear are things like legal partnerships that bind you together with somebody. And I would just say, get some wise counsel, pray about those business situations and um, seek wisdom, honesty, and uh, uh, seek discernment from the Lord on those things. Outside of that, um, well, one, first of all, you may say, wow, that sounds like a lot of trouble. I don't want to go through the trouble of asking myself those things and everything that I do that relates to the world. I would just say this. It's worth it. It's worth it. Holiness matters that much. I, I don't want to set myself up to fail the one who has done the most for me. Holiness matters, so it's worth it for me to evaluate. And I'd also say ministry matters that much. Uh, that we would question whether we're spending time with people the way we should. I don't want to withhold ministry from the people who need it the most. And that means that I need to be out there having relationships with other people that aren't believers in the Lord Jesus. Ministry demands that. But I have to be careful about the nature of that relationship. So I want to close with this last question about how we engage. And I saved this one for last because I think we blow this one more than we blow any of the others. In other words, more than we blow... Uh, getting too deep into relationships with the world, I think we messed this one up. And it's this question. Do I spend enough time with non-Christians to see clear, consistent fruit among them? In other words, am I spending enough time with lost people to be leading some of them to faith in Jesus Christ, to be taking them step by step a little closer to an understanding of God and of his word? As much as we struggle with too much connection with the world, I think maybe we struggle more with too little connection with the world. Um, throw that out there for your consideration, for you to take that back to God with it. 
Paul here, the Holy Spirit speaking through him, says you need to be separate. It is holding you back in your affection for believers and for God. And you need to come out of this unequal yoked relationship you have with people in the world. Weigh this out. Talk to God about it. Consider maybe you need to come out some more from the world. Maybe you need to dive in some more. Um, in a safe and a proper, biblically right way, like Jesus being a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Consider it, pray about it. Let me close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the balanced picture of exactly what this should look like. And Paul is. My goodness, he's telling them they need to come out from unequally yoked, too deep of relationships with the lost, with the world. And yet this man's been his life pursuing worldly people for the sake of the gospel. Um, Lord, it may be that, that that question about am I speaking on spiritual things with the world may be the telltale sign that we are too deep in a relationship and for all the wrong reasons. Uh, Lord, will you please guide us in that and be honored uh, as we as we obey you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace toward us before you ever ask us one thing. Um, we love you for that. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to spend with us. Um, if you have questions, please contact us through the website or through the, um, the phone number. Have a great day.